Hello and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, welcome to the attendees and hello to everyone watching the live stream. And if you're watching this as a recording, hello from the past. Uh, welcome to our October working lunch. Our host today, Shannon, is going to be walking us through principles of navigating the sale. Uh, I know this is a meaty discussion, so I'm going to cut it out with the preamble and hand it over to you, Shannon. Thank you, Mark, and thanks everybody for being here and taking some time out of your day. My hope is that I will add some value and you will walk away with some ideas that will help you feel better in sales conversations. And so with that, I'll kick it off. I am Shannon Lee. I'm the Managing Director at Win Without Pitching. And for those of you not familiar with who we are, we focus on sales training for creative professionals. And so Blair Enns, the founder of Win Without Pitching, set out on a mission many years ago to frankly make selling more fun, uh, to remove the baggage that comes with the word sales, and to bring some confidence uh, and a point of view to selling that just makes it uh, more human uh, and, and really sees you as taking the expert practitioner role in the sale. So that's what we're all about. That's our mission in life is to, to build more confidence for you in the sale as you're having those conversations. And so I want to share with you first our model of the world, how we view the world. It's this idea of the expert's journey. And many times when clients come to us, they are sitting in that vendor role that maybe some of you can relate to. It's a role that oftentimes can feel exhausting and dismal and feeling like you are doing the dog and pony show and promising everything and cutting prices and all of these things that you just know um, don't feel good and are not right for you and the firm that you're with or that you own. And you're basically an order taker. Well, we want to shift that. We want that to be very different uh, for our clients. And we want to move you to a place where you're really the expert practitioner. You are behaving and guiding and demonstrating selectivity as any expert would. And there's a path to get there. And we believe that that path really begins with positioning. It's where your power resides in the sale. When you are seen as meaningfully different, you have the ability to affect so many things. Most importantly, winning what we call this polite battle for control in the sale that sees you moving from that vendor role to that role of expert practitioner in the eyes of your client to be, and they let you lead in the sale, which sets you up to lead in the engagement. And you're able to charge what you're worth and you're able to do your best work. And so it really begins with being seen as meaningfully different. And that's a positioning exercise. And it's more than linguistics. It is a fundamental business strategy. That's, that's really how we view this. And when you're well positioned, when you're differentiated, it makes it so much easier to communicate and tell the world who you are and how you help. This is marketing, this is lead generation. And a well positioned firm knows who to target, knows what they wanna say, can create content that is deeply insightful. And so as you move through this journey of moving from vendor to expert practitioner through positioning and marketing, selling becomes something that I think is just frankly more fun and more effective because your job is really to find out if you can help this client who has come to you. And in the sale, you should be demonstrating what it's going to be like to work with you. The sale should really be the sample of that. And when you're well positioned and properly marketing and selling from a place of expertise, you're setting your team up who's going to execute on that work to do their best work and to be viewed as an expert and not a vendor or a task taker. And once these things again, like add up and come into place, pricing becomes an exercise that really sees you focused on creating value for that client to be. And pricing becomes a very open and transparent kind of conversation. We're not dancing around the money talk. And I'm going to share a little bit more about that in a minute. All of this leads to your ability to close a piece of work and remove the tension and anxiety that typically comes in that typical closing meeting where you feel again like it's presentation mode, dog and pony mode. And it becomes about facilitating a choice around the options that you've put in front of that client for how you're gonna to work together. And so 
this is the expert's journey. It is a journey. It takes time to get there. It takes practice. It takes doing some things that sometimes are considered sacrifice and making difficult business decisions. But in the end, it's, it's a, just a much better place to exist. And you do your best work and you're paid appropriately for it. And your client relationships really win as a result. So that's how we view the world. And we have an overarching framework of conversations, conversations that take place in the buyer's journey that we really hang everything on. And so quickly, just so you kind of have a, a level set or understanding of where we're coming from here, the first conversation we call the probative conversation. The probative conversation includes positioning and lead generation. It means that you're largely not present for this conversation. It means that your agents of thought leadership, uh, the webinars you do, the articles you write, the podcast you're on, are speaking on your behalf, right? You're delivering your expertise through the content that you're generating and putting out into the world. Maybe it's those clients who love you and refer you, right? So this conversation is happening without you being there and somebody is deciding, gosh, they really know what they're talking about. So I'm gonna pick the phone up and call and see if I can get some help then the qualifying conversation happens. That is typically the first kind of in-person or on Zoom these days conversation in the sale. And in the qualifying conversation, your job is to vet the lead to see if there is a fit. This is a conversation where you're doing not as much talking, but a lot of listening and a lot of asking of questions and really demonstrating that you're as selective as that client is when they're making their choice about which agency or firm to hire. If all goes well in the qualifying conversation, you're driving the next step. That next step is the value conversation. The value conversation is a game changer because the value conversation is all about pricing. And it's all about what do you want, not what do you need. They may come to you for a website, but what they really need is a complete revamp of the customer journey. So you're digging and you're getting at the wants beyond the needs, the wants of the individuals beyond those of the corporation, and really starting to think about how will we measure this? How will we know if we're successful? And assigning value to that in the form of a range of compensation that feels fair. And then you're going to leave that value conversation with the client, go back to your team and sit down and think about solutions. So one thing that never happens in the win without pitching journey is you don't think about solutions until after you get through the value conversation. We want to kind of deprogram this idea of going in solutions minded, which is natural because you do these things that you do a lot. You see patterns and you think, oh, I know how to solve that. We want to break that and let you go in more open minded and not think about solutions until you understand the real want, the real desired future state and the real need in terms of how will we know if we're successful. So you then after value conversation, think through solutions, create a proposal, and then win without pitching land. That is a one page, three option proposal. It is possible. And then you move to the closing meeting. And the closing meeting should become the least press pressure filled uh, conversation in the sale because you are simply facilitating a choice around one of the options that you presented to the client. And so we think about selling in terms of these frameworks of probative, qualifying, value, and closing. And you simply say to yourself, okay, where am I at in the sale? Which conversation is this? What's my objective in this conversation? And what framework do I use? So this is just kind of giving you some context for how we view the world and uh, kind of where we spend time helping to get you to that place of, of behaving like the expert. Further, this idea of positioning is really, really important. And positioning I know can be an exercise that comes with a lot of baggage for a lot of people because they've had bad experiences with consultants, tried to get it done on their own, couldn't, couldn't make it happen, changed positioning, you know, depending on what was kind of in vogue at that time. It just, it comes with a lot of kind of anxiety and fear and you feel like you're gonna miss out. And, you know, it, it's true that it requires sacrifice and it's true that it is, it is a big difficult business decision, but there are many benefits. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, your power really resides in how you're positioned. Your power does not reside in how much money the client has to spend. It really resides in, do they see you as meaningfully different or not? And so it's foundational. 
for your firm. It's, it's the place from which you all choose to show up and operate from each day, all on the same page, working in unison, working towards the greater mission. It also helps to reduce, sometimes outright eliminate the competition. You see the playing field a little more level because if you're well positioned, there are going to be fewer of you claiming expertise in that, in that space. And because of that, you will see your win rates increase and you will have the ability to charge more because going in and being seen as the expert comes with a whole lot of credibility, right? People are willing to sit up and listen and take your guidance. It also lowers your cost of sale. It is very true that the higher your cost of sale is, the less likely you are to win. When we see firms with low cost of sale, we see firms who are typically winning more than losing or saying no more often because they're really clear about what kind of client is the best fit for them. Further, it helps you to target. It helps you to really figure out who it is you want to be talking to and who you want to be reaching out to. And it sets you up to be able to lead from the beginning as the expert in these conversations. That's lead generation. That's what I was just talking about. And then my personal favorite is your stronger personal balance sheet. When you're well positioned, there is a lot of confidence that comes from that. And with confidence comes your belief that you have the right to be in that sales conversation and providing guidance for these organizations that you want to work with. And that like taste of deep competence also is something that happens where it, it resides within you. You feel it, you know, when you are the expert and you sit up taller and you stand up taller and you're more willing to kind of speak the truth. We're going to talk about what I mean by that in a minute. So just again, uh, some foundational thinking on our perspective, how we view the conversations that happen in the sale and why we believe positioning to be the most important thing when it comes to winning uh, when you're selling. So this quote from Blair Enns, our founder, you're not in the business of convincing, was something that I heard him say back in, I think it was about 2006 when I first met Blair. I was working for a design firm in Seattle called Methodology, and we were at a conference where he was speaking. I was with one of the partners, and he stood on that stage and delivered those words. You are not in the business of convincing. You have no business convincing anyone of anything ever in the sale. And I'll tell you what, I was completely transformed in that moment. I was completely freed because until then, I somehow had lost myself. I had turned into this sales robot in this business development role that I was in. And I was like this pitch woman. And I was trying to sell things and make people happy and cutting prices and over-promising. And it just, it was gross. It, it wasn't me. It wasn't the values and beliefs I came into that role with. And I don't really understand like what overtook me in that moment. I do know selling is, is hard. And I do know selling requires a lot of resiliency. But I also, uh, in that moment, recognized that in losing myself along the way and kind of turning into that pitch woman, I had forgotten about the human conversation that needs to happen in the sale and the honesty that needs to happen in the sale and the ability to question and push back. And I got in touch again with those qualities. And we decided at that point, yeah, let's bring Blair in and have us take, you know, take him through, him take us through this approach. And we really revamped the way that we sold. And I've been selling the Win Without Pitching way for more than a decade now and still sell uh, for Win Without Pitching to this day. So I'm still in the trenches. I still know what this feels like and certainly working with clients and helping them through all of the challenges of it. So I'm right there with you if you're in the sales hot seat at your firm. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of not going into convince mode and this idea of mindset and behavior and confidence when it comes to selling. Um, and I'm going to do that through what we call the principles of navigating the sale. And so when someone comes to work with us, we're teaching them the frameworks of the four conversations that I shared earlier. We're sharing with them the need to position and helping them go through those exercises. So on top of those frameworks are a set of principles or behaviors that you can bring to the sale to help yourself out in these moments when you feel like, oh, confidence wanes, or I'm not 
quite sure how to show up, you know, to kick things off. These principles will be great things for your toolkit. And so that's my hope is that as we go through these, you can take a couple back, um, implement then, them into your next conversation and, and see if you can, you know, drive some change for yourself. So the first principle is mindset first. And we could train you how to sell all day long. But if your mind, mindset is not in the right place, the correct behaviors are not going to follow. Oftentimes there's this disconnect, right, of what you think you're supposed to do in the sale, um, which causes you to turn into the sales robot I was talking about earlier and all these weird behaviors show up. And so when we think about mindset, we think about things like, what are your motivators that might cause you to go a little sideways in a sales conversation? Do you have the need to be liked? Do you want to please everybody and make everybody happy? So does that cause you to do things that, you know, might overpromise because you're afraid to say no, um, or might see you cutting price because you think that's what would make the client happy? Or maybe you're somebody that has the need to win. You're super competitive. And so you're aggressive or you're domineering in the sale. So it's important to kind of get in touch with like, what are my motivators? You know, what drives me and what causes me to go a little sideways in these new business conversations and get in touch with those and release those before you go into your next sales conversation. And we have a, a little mantra, a Jedi mindset. Um, Blair is a big Star Wars fan. And so there's a lot of that kind of peppered within sometimes, but sometimes people think this is a little hokey, but it's really not. If you can give yourself five or 10 minutes or however many minutes you need before you go into your next sales conversation and say this mantra to yourself and think about this mantra and get clear and get focused and release any baggage, you'll go in there and be able to behave a little bit differently um, and trust yourself in that moment. And so the mantra is this, I am the expert, I am the prize. Typically, we go in thinking we're the vendor, right? And we're going to do anything we can to win and the client is the prize. It's not the case. You're the prize to be won. And it's not coming from a place of arrogance, right? It's coming from a place of you have deep expertise that resides in you and your firm. And you can help your client to be solve whatever problem they're up against. And so you are really the prize to be won here. This comes from your focus. This comes from your positioning, right? And why you are meaningfully different than the others they might be looking at. And you are on a mission to help. This is your purpose. Our purpose, our mission at Win Without Pitching is to change the way creative services are bought and sold the world over, one business at a time. And we'll probably die trying, but we get out of bed every day and we work towards that mission and we will never sacrifice that mission. And I want that to be the same for you and your firm. You're on a mission to help your clients and you won't sacrifice that mission because they want you to do the process differently or they want you to do lots of work, but not pay you well, whatever the case may be. Like you stay focused on that mission. I am the expert. I am the prize to be won and I am on a mission to help. And I can only do that if you let me lead, right? This is you behaving like an expert and leading in the sale. You can only help if you have a client that turns over the table to you and says, you're the expert, take care of me, guide me, let, I'll let you lead. And all will not follow and that is okay. And this is about emotional detachment. This is about your ability to hover 30,000 feet above, and see it for what it is and say to yourself, I wanna work with people who believe what I believe. I wanna do my best work. Not everybody's a fit and that's okay. And detach emotionally from some of these opportunities that you're involved in that cause you to do things you wish you wouldn't do if you're too emotionally attached. And so as we think about this kind of on the, the level of the firm, it helps when you're well positioned, as you can see, right? You're deriving expertise. That's why you're the expert and you're the prize and you have a higher purpose. You have a perspective and a mission. If your firm right now is more generalist in nature, that's okay. You can still be an expert on something. You yourself could show up in that sale and say, you know what? I'm an expert at making people feel heard and seen. I do a good job of that. I'm a good listener. Bring that to bear in your mantra. Or I am on a mission to help. I'm on a mission to help my client feel like we can help them tackle their challenges. I have a great ability 
to kind of see what that problem is and ask the right questions and provide some stories of reassurance how we've done it for others. This can be your personal mantra. Again, like if your firm isn't yet positioned the way that it should be, you can still take advantage of this mantra and say it for yourself and bring your own superpowers to bear. And I can only do that if you let me lead this client. That really is about somebody willing to enter into a com conversation with you and two people across the table and just kind of put it all out there and be transparent. And, and you can help somebody feel comfortable, right? By stating that, hey, we're this first conversation may feel a little different than the other firms you're talking with. And that's because we really care about finding out if we can help you or not. It's equally as important to us that we can be of good service to you as it is for you to find the right firm. So we wanna see if we'll be a good fit for each other. You can use that kind of language to get them to let, let you lead, let you take, take over in that conversation and help them out. And finally, you'll detach from whatever your need is going into that conversation. And I recognize for some people, the owners of firms, maybe work has been slow and your need is to make payroll. And that is a lot of pressure, but you need to, in that moment, release that and say, you know what? I still need to take on the right kind of work that will pay us well and provide the right profit and my team will enjoy working on um, and be motivated by it, right? So there's a way for you to kind of bring your own personal storyline into this mantra. So give yourself some time, say that, read it, listen to it, record yourself. I have clients that do that as well before you go into your next sales conversation. And I'm gonna share this deck um, with Mark and he can share it out to the group as well. So you have some of this um, at the ready if you wanna refer back to it. Next, selling is leading. And this is really uh, all about this idea of the sale is the sample of what it's going to be like to work with you. And you wanna signal early on that you need the ability to lead in the sale so that you can lead in the engagement. Leading in the sale feels like demonstrating selectivity, for example, as, as I was saying earlier, you know, hey, we, we are equally as interested in finding out if you're a good fit for us as you are in finding out if we're a good fit for you. So we have some questions that we wanna ask. And there's a way that we run this process, right? The, the next conversation, if we decide this is going well, is to have a conversation largely focused on value and what can we really accomplish for you? You want to, from the beginning, signal that you're different. Lead in the sale so you can lead in the engagement. Experts also behave in this calm and reassuring manner. That's another way to lead in the sale. If somebody is um, really excited, really animated, nervous, you can serve a purpose by showing up as that calm, sage, wise guide and try to help set a different level of energy and kind of redirect conversation around them and the questions you need to get answered in order to really find out if this is a fit. So hang on to that concept of selling is leading and, and think about those experts in your life that you admire the most um, or really show up like an expert, a doctor, right? Or a lawyer or people who are in those roles that are seen as experts and given that credibility right away. What kind of behaviors do they bring to bear that would demonstrate them leading in the sale? What can you maybe you know, take on for yourself there? We also think a little bit about this idea of win without pitching. This is our mission, right? We understand it's not always possible to win without pitching, but if you're an expert and you're leading in the sale and you can't win without pitching, you can't like avoid the RFP process or you have to follow some process that that client is using to run the selection, then try to derail it. Try to, try to think about ways to make it clear to the client that sometimes an RFP or a pitch or doing free work or whatever the case may be is not the best way to go about hiring a firm like yours. And frankly, not always the most fair way to go about hiring a firm like yours, especially if it, it sees you working for free, giving ideas away for free. Um, you can derail the pitch by offering up a different way to run the process. Maybe you start out with a diagnostic to really assess is the problem the problem, right? There, there are all sorts of things you can do, but if you can't win without pitching, then you want to try to derail the pitch. And if you can't derail the pitch, you want to figure out a way to gain the advantage. You want to figure out a way to have that inside track. And that may be gaining a concession, like getting a conversation with the team that's going to be involved in making the decision, access to decision makers, maybe being the one to present last or present first, whatever it is, like figuring out a way to get them to demonstrate some behavior 
and give you a little something that shows that they see you as different, right? See you as maybe having an advantage over the others. And finally, if you can't do these things, if you can't win without pitching, if you can't derail the pitch, if you can't gain the advantage, you have to think about walking away. You have to think about saying no. And it's important to be able to do that because through your ability to say no and really assess is this the right fit or not and exiting gracefully, if it's not, you walk away with your integrity intact. And that means a lot because they may come back around with a better opportunity that's a better fit for what you do. And remember that about you, that you were honest, that this wasn't right, that you said no with some grace. So it leaves the door open. And it also, if it's the wrong opportunity, protects you and your firm, frankly, from, you know, working and not getting paid right or taking on a project where it just is kind of a drag day to day to deal with that client. So four priorities to think about when you're trying to lead in the sale. This is a good one. Say what you're thinking. This is one that often is really difficult because we don't want to ruffle feathers or offend or we're just afraid because maybe what we think isn't going to be viewed as smart or valuable or whatever the case may be. But I can promise you in all the years I've been doing this and all of the agency owners that I've worked with, you all have really good gut instincts and you've been at it long enough to know when the client isn't thinking about something correctly or something is off. It's really important to speak up sooner than later and tell the truth, say what you think. Because if you don't, if you wait and resentment builds, you really run the risk of blowing up or coming across in a, a pretty offensive way. So you wanna say what you think early. You know, hey, it occurs to me that you, you might not be able to afford us. Can we talk about what you're looking to invest in this initiative before we go any further? Or I'm sensing you don't want to give me access to the rest of the team who's gonna be a part of making the decision. Can we talk a little bit about why, right? You've gotta speak up in these moments. I'm not sure the challenge you think you have is actually the challenge. You know, please like be beg my pardon here, right? But can we pause and like dig into that a little bit? You have to find the words that are comfortable for you, but you really wanna speak up sooner than later and say what you're thinking. It'll save you a lot of headache when you get later in the sale or into the engagement only to find out like, yeah, I was right. I should have, should have said something about that. The next one is winning the race to object. Our, our thinking here is that objections are your friends if you surface them early, but they're your enemy if they're surfaced late in the sale and they can derail anything and everything pretty quickly. And I think most of you know what the common objections are that you come up against in the sales scenarios that you're in. It's your job to put those things on the table for the client to be to deal with. That helps you maintain some power in the sale in a really positive way. So those are things like, what kind of an investment are you looking to make in this initiative? That's the money talk, right? Putting that on the table sooner than later to get a sense if you're on the same page or not is really important. Or you said earlier that this project has to be done ASAP. Why, right? ASAP is never a good thing and it's not a meaningful timeline to hang anything on. You know, or I'm sensing you don't see us as the right firm to solve this challenge for you. Am I right about that? Whatever it is, think of the common objections you come up against, put them on the table first for that client to deal with. It, it's really helpful because if they show up late in the closing meeting, you have a much harder time overcoming them if you can overcome them at all at that point in the sale. And then embrace silence. This is such a powerful skill and can be such a game changer. And it's probably one where it's really hard because it, silence is just like uncomfortable as all get out for most of us. Your ability to just stop talking and be quiet. Whether it is after you ask the client a question to give them space to answer or putting the, the money talk on the table for them to deal with is so powerful because you learn so much in that silence. When you try to fill the silence, you tend to give in, give concessions, acquiesce, go on and on and prattle on and not make a lot of sense and come across as nervous, right? Make things more clouded or confusing. 
And so I challenge you to, to stop talking and embrace silence, ask your question and be done. Or ask your question if they're not going to let you have a conversation with the CEO, for example, but the CEO is the person who's ultimately gonna decide. Then I would be saying, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me that we can't have a conversation with the CEO if he or she has the ultimate you know, authority to decide who to work with. Why wouldn't you want us to talk to them? Silence, stop talking. Or what kind of funds have you allocated for this initiative? Silence, stop talking, let them answer. Let them deal with it if it's an objection. And it's okay to say no. I alluded to this earlier, but it's always okay to say no. And it's better to say no more often than not. I think a lot of times you take on too many opportunities that, that maybe you should have said no to. And I bet if you went and looked at your last 10 opportunities and did a little assessment, you might see that, mm, yeah, we probably should have said no to some of those for whatever the reason was. It's really a way to leave, as I mentioned, with your integrity intact. It's been lovely to talk with you. I've really enjoyed hearing more about your company and this initiative. It's just not a great fit for us, but I sure would like to leave the door open now that you know more about us for something down the road that may be a better fit. That's a really graceful way to say no. Or you might just, hey, this isn't a great fit for our firm, but you should call this firm. They're great. They're really good at this. They're experts in this. Can I connect you with the owner? right? Whatever it is you need to do to be able to say no and let it feel comfortable is just so important. And that client to be is going to appreciate it more than you think, even if you're worried about, will it make them mad or whatever the case may be. We have a great little tool called the closing the loop email. Maybe some of you uh, have seen this or use this. This is a great way to say no. Um, it's a form of saying no. This is for opportunities that have gone dark. You've been ghosted. They're just not getting back to you send this email and you will get a response. And so it's really use it in its purest form. Hi, I haven't heard back from you on this XYZ project. So I'm just gonna assume you've gone in a different direction or your priorities have changed. Let me know if we can be of assistance in the future. Signed, Shannon. It will get you a response quickly. I think we've had records of like under 10 seconds that clients have received a response back because half the time what's going on is your client-to-be is just busy, right? Their world is more pressure-filled than our world sometimes. And they're just busy and they need a push, a gentle reminder, or maybe something did change and they were just frankly afraid to tell you because they didn't want to hurt your feelings. This gives them a professional out. This gives them a way to say no in a professional manner uh, where they may or may not explain why, but at least they can just release that for themselves. Try this email, this closing the loop email, keep it in its purest form. Don't add anything, right? Like you just, I'm just assuming you've gone in a different direction or things have changed. No big deal. You know where to find us if you want to resume the conversation in the future. Thank you. Signed your name. Give that a try. It's a great form of saying no. So the principles, mindset, give yourself the space going into these conversations to say the mantra or do whatever you need to do to release any baggage that you typically take in with you and go in just showing up and being present and ready to have a conversation. Remember to lead. Remember to be the one that needs to lead in the sales so you set your team up to lead in the engagement and say what you're thinking. Be brave, trust your gut, muster the courage to get those words out sooner than later. Apologize going into it. So sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody here, but I'm a little worried that there isn't enough budget to do this project the right way. Can we talk about that? Win the race to object. Make a list of what the common objections are that you come up against in all of your sales scenarios and have them ready to go and try to get them on the table in that first qualifying conversation to see, is this person really, are they the right fit for us or not? Embrace silence. Stop talking. <laughs> Give yourself the opportunity. And if you just are silent a few seconds longer, you will win that battle. Somebody eventually is going to break and talk. So you just have to outweigh the other person. And then finally, remember, it's okay to say no. It's okay to walk away from something that isn't the right fit, that might not make sense for you and your firm. And you can find some graceful language to do that. I, I really have no doubt about that. So hopefully these are some 
some ideas, some tips, some principles you can take back with you, try out in your next sales conversation or maybe any conversation you're in the middle of. I think some of it translates well to other areas of life too. And see a little bit of a difference for yourself um, when you're guiding these conversations. So that's, that's my hope is that when you go into these conversations, you are yourself, you have a conversation, you don't go into sales robot mode, you choose one of these ideas to try, maybe stop talking, maybe win the race to object, maybe say what you're thinking. And you bring this attitude of experimentation and you just try one little thing, one baby step to make change happen for yourself and see how it goes. I think it'll go well. We have a lot of, lot of great stories um, to share that clients bring back when they embrace some of these principles. And I, again, I'll send this deck along, but if you want to learn more about us, there are some great books, The Manifesto, Pricing Creativity. You can also access all of our thought leadership. There's tons of it on the website. You can uh, go to our YouTube channel and ask a question on YouTube and I'll answer you in that format. Uh, Blair, our founder, does a podcast with David Baker, who's another great expert in this field. You can check out the podcast um, or go to the YouTube channel, as I was saying. So I will pause and Mark, see what questions anybody has. Excellent. Thank you so much, Shannon. And attendees mm -hmm. and, and live streamers, uh, I apologize. My camera is not working with my new computer setup, so I'm not being shy. I'm just having some tech issues today. <clears throat> but that was great, Shannon. I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just going back to the kind of the beginning of your journey in this mm -hmm. whole world and, and tell us how, you know, what sparked the passion for you and why you decided to, you know, do this type of consulting work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like probably many people experience, you never know what you're going to end up doing. Um, I set out on a different path. My, my college degree was in international relations in Spanish. And I thought I was going to go be an ambassador in a foreign country. I don't know. Like I just tried a bunch of different stuff. And I think what I discovered along the way is that I enjoyed communicating. Um, so, you know, this idea of being out front and having conversations lent itself to marketing and public relations and I landed on the corporate side and spent about a decade working for companies like Safeco Insurance, AT&T Wireless, different communications roles, marketing roles, and I hired agencies. I was always the one hiring them for marketing efforts or annual reports. And that's when I met the firm I mentioned earlier, Methodology. And it was also about the time that like corporate America was, I was done. I just, I, I needed a smaller experience. I wasn't as good at playing the game as others were. And I wouldn't trade that opportunity in that time I spent, but the opportunity presented itself to go to work for methodology in a sales and marketing capacity. And I wasn't quite sure what that meant because it was more selling actually than marketing, but I really like found a unique ability, found this, this kind of energizing role in being out there and sharing the expertise of the firm and identifying problems that clients had. And I was really I was good at it and I enjoyed it and it energized me and got lucky enough along the way to meet Blair and learn this win without pitching approach, which made even deeper sense to me because it allowed me to be a person in the sale and have conversations and release the, the pitch deck and the capabilities deck and really get to like, what's going on? What's the problem? And that just um, was a journey that allowed me to also sell for a lot of different agencies. I went to work for a company called Catapult for a while and sold uh, Catapult is a company that agencies hire to outsource their biz dev efforts to. So I sold for dozens of agencies of different shapes and sizes. And when Blair decided to move from being a consulting company to a training company, asked me to come on board as a coach. And I was sort of ready for a break from selling and knew enough by then that I felt I could really teach people how to do this. And you know, along the way, I also learned more about what it meant to guide and advise owners of businesses and what that adult developmental journey is when you're trying to change habit and behavior. And so I think um, for me, I learned that the smaller the company, the smaller that kind of experience was, the better, because I could affect change day to day. And I love helping people feel more confident and take control of their business. And we get to do that every day in the work that we do here. And it's really cool to see how we can move the needle pretty quickly um, it, when people take you know action behind these teachings. Awesome, thank you for that. I'm, I'm gonna mm -hmm. jump right into the Q&A because we've got some questions in here that are really good. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to start with the earliest one. And everyone in the in the chat, if you use the Q and A feature, uh, it'll help make sure that we get to all of your questions rather than posting them in the chat because they can kind of disappear in there. So anonymous attendee says <laughs> positioning statement, and that's okay. Anonymous attendee, yeah. we don't we we respect that <laughs> positioning We're statement. Serious for ideas and creative are such a challenge. Any advice on how to begin crafting these? Yeah, we start, we try to put you in a box for a little bit, honestly, and force you to kind of look at it in its purest expression. And that is what we call focus. And your focus is comprised of your market and your discipline. So who you help and how you help them. So if you can do an exercise to just think about, like for us at Win Without Pitching, it's sales training is the discipline and the market is creative professionals. So maybe it's website design for um, health and well-being, right? What, whatever it is, like just start at the start and don't add flowery descriptive language to things. That's where you sometimes kind of hide the, the tough decision you're trying to make around where you might, might want to specialize. Then you have to kind of take a look at what have you done where you've been most profitable? What have you done where it's been most energizing and you've done really effective work that have, that's delivered really great outcomes? Where might you want to go that you don't know a lot about now, but you know you want to pivot into the future? So there's kind of a guided set of questions and exercises like that that we take people through to kind of get them thinking about where might we pivot to or how might we narrow a little more? Um, and it also has to do with you know, an understanding of um, where where expertise resides today. Like, what are the ten things you know to be true about what you do? And maybe if you're an expert in that area, but you need to go deeper, what are the ten things you should know that you don't to be an expert in that area? So those are some things you can think about in terms of starting some exercises down the path of how do you pick a focus. Excellent. And I'll say one more thing, Mark, it doesn't have to be vertical. It doesn't have to be marketing for financial services. It can be demographic. It can be psychographic. It can be built around a strong point of view also. So there's some room to kind of like move beyond just choosing a vertical or a discipline. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next one uh, from Natasha. If you're a relatively small agency working on acquiring more clients, how do you start the sales outreach conversation with prospects? Yeah, so it, it's helpful to start with your positioning. I'm going to sound like a broken record, right? So I would send, first I would target a top 10 list. I'll just kind of give you a, a tactical way to think about this. Who are 10 clients who you would like to work with, who you think, you know, whatever it is that you do would be helpful to them? Company, find the contact name. I would send an email like, hey, Shannon, you know, I do um, marketing for uh, specifically millennial audiences within financial services. And the outcomes we deliver for our clients um, tend to be these sorts of things and kind of list some of the business benefits. I wanted to reach out today to see if you'd be interested in having a conversation and if I might be able to help with anything. And I would end that outreach with the sentence, feel free to say no if the timing isn't right or you don't see a fit. That's another professional out. I think that kind of really clear targeted email with that professional out often drives some conversations. And so be really specific about your ask, create the top 10 list, and just it's, view it as targeted outbound. It's not cold calling because you should really be targeting people that would benefit from what you do. You might even add a sentence in there about similar client types or, you know, some of those sorts of things as well. I also think it helps to have this hero piece um, that I, I mentioned. Our, our hero piece at Win Without Pitching is the Win Without Pitching Manifesto. It's a book. You don't have to write a book. It can be a long form article or a video about your perspective on how the work has to be brought to bear. What's non-negotiable for you, your ideology. And send that out to some people like, hey, just want to introduce you to our firm. This is what we do. This is how we believe it should be done. Um, if you're on board ideologically with us, we'd love to have a conversation. So it's, again, like finding ways to, to show you're different in this outreach and to be really clear about what it is you're asking for. I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, it looks like... Uh... 
Jeff put one of your first questions in the chat. So I guess it was so good that we definitely wanted to have an answer for it. Uh, you mentioned a one page proposal with options for clients. Could yeah. you touch on that a bit? You bet. Um, this one really, uh, this is a game changer and, and one that uh, is often hard because many people are so used to these long 10, 20, 30 page proposals. They turn around for clients. The idea is you want to introduce choice into the equation in these sales conversations. If you give a client a proposal with one option and one price for how to solve that problem, you are forcing them to go compare you against others. If you have the ability to give a client a proposal with three options, kind of loosely outlined, maybe option A is you only have $25,000, we can sell you a block of hours and you work as much as you can towards that block of hours to hit their goal. I get that's risky for the client, but it's an option. And the anchor option, option three on the high end, is you saying, we'll work based on the outcomes we think we can deliver. We're really good at you know, marketing for banks. And so we're willing to say, we'll help you get 20 new leads, increase awareness on your website. It, it'll cost more because some of it might be tied to compensation or hitting metrics, right? You may have a portion of it paid in fees and a portion of it paid in performance bonus when you hit metrics, but it's a big option that it might take you up on. And the middle option might just be deliverables. You came to me, you wanted a website, some new uh, marketing materials and better SEO. So we'll get those things done for you. And it's a hundred thousand dollars. By introducing three options, you allow them to see different ways you can work together. And it stimulates a conversation, not you presenting one price, one option where they're backed into a corner and it, it's like, well, okay, so we'll let you know because we got to compare this now against others. So that's the thinking around providing options. The other thing is we'd rather see you get paid to write the long detailed proposal or the contract. So that's why we also like the idea of three options. Okay, which option works best for you? Great, middle option. I'll go back and write out the detailed scope of work now. So at least you're on a path to getting that verbal commit and spending your time developing a proposal around an option that makes sense versus like a hope that this one proposal run one price will work. Yeah, there's a follow-up to that um, from Mary. Uh, curious about the time between sending a proposal and hearing back. We all are curious about that, Mary. <laughs> You're often so. racing to get them. Uh, everything as quickly as possible. So fire drill. Uh, yeah. client had a specific timeline and then it goes quiet for a period of time. I never know how to handle that period of quiet. Uh, I can't yeah. wait to hear your silver bullet answer for that. <laughs> so this is a very good example of what it means to lead in the sale. Never, ever do you send a proposal over and wait to hear back because it is your policy at your firm, and you can choose to use that language, that you always present your proposals. They don't walk through the organization and speak for themselves. And so that is how you position it from the very beginning when these sales conversations begin with this client. We're happy to share a proposal with you. Here's how it works for our firm. We walk you through the proposal, and we want the team there who's going to be a part of making the decision. That's how it goes. Like you just like, you just kind of draw the line, right? And if they're not willing to do that, then begins the conversation. Can you tell me why? Why would you want to have us lob a proposal over the fence for you to interpret on your own and not have the ability to ask us questions about it, right? Like you just, you got to lean into the why and sometimes point out the absurdity of the process itself. And so it begins with a policy you set for yourself that you only present a proposal and send a proposal when you can be the one doing it in person and then they can have it and look at it afterwards. That's awesome advice. I uh, got two more questions here. Uh, would you choose to use a similar email, uh, the closing the loop example for clients who won't respond at all and give you some FaceTime? Um, yes, definitely. If you have a client that is not responding at all, send that email. If they don't respond after that, you're done with them. As far as I'm concerned, move on. Like that is your permission to release them and release that emotional kind of angst that comes with all of that. 
but I want to make sure I was understanding your question correctly about the FaceTime piece of it. Um, if whoever uh, wrote that question wants to put some clarification in the chat, or if you want to hop on mic, let me know. Or you don't have to. <laughs> Yeah, we can circle back. Yeah, we can circle back. We do have another question while we're waiting for that. Oh, meaning, oh, what is the best way to get a client to respond uh, with email? Mm. Yeah, I mean, if somebody really has gone dark and they're not getting back to you, I would send the closing the loop. But if you're thinking of just kind of in general other ways, um, I think I think it's first taking a look at what where are you at in the sales cycle? Did you drive a next step? Um, what is it that you are asking them to respond to? Are you being clear, you know, and whatever that is. And sometimes then I think you just got to try to pick up the phone. You know, I know it's harder these days, but sometimes getting out of the email inbox, if you have a way to reach them, might be a great way to go too. All right. I'm going to throw in my own question, actually. So um, in, in our world, you know, the, it's the account teams and client services uh, who are typically doing the sales. And there's always a, uh, in the Northwest, and I think on the West Coast in general, there's a talent shortage for people who want to go into that field, um, maybe because it's hard and a little bit stressful. What would you look for if you were a hiring manager and you're building out a client services and account management team? Oh, that's a great question. What are like, Honestly, I, God. I, like to make it an yeah. easier one to answer, what would be the top three traits you'd be looking for? Yep. I, I literally answered this question for a client earlier today. The top three traits I would be looking for, and can I just have four? First, it would be, are they hungry? Are they smart? Are they humble? And will they make your company a better place? And we get the hungry, smart, and humble um, from a, a book that's called The Ideal Team Player. And we always ask that question at the end, are they going to make us better? And if it's not a clear yes, then you keep mm -hmm. moving. So those are three great ways to kind of just really take a look at somebody through a different lens. Awesome, because I know that there are some people on this uh, live stream and on the webinar right now who are actively going through those resumes for uh, account managers. So yeah, something good to keep in mind. Uh, final question, can you provide a post event or post event some email responses that you've used as examples? Sure. Yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll and I can send that out with the, with the recap mm -hmm. too. Or yeah, we can put I'll it put in together a package of goodies along with this presentation deck. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, anonymous attendee, keep an eye out uh, for in your email. We'll we'll put all this information in a blog post along with a recording uh, and a link to Shannon's deck today. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, Shannon, this was amazing. Thank you so much for coming out and. Thank you, attendees, uh, anonymous and non-anonymous. Uh, we, we love having you here. Thanks for being part of Think Northwest and use your umbrellas. It's going to be a wet weekend. Yeah, Northwest weekend. Thank you, Mark. Thank love you, everybody. It. I think everybody, it was great. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.